speaking for the NUM, we associate ourselves with what's been said for the other unions. And the purpose of additional remarks is to draw attention for the inquiry to the union's experience over a period of time in the early 1980s up to the early 1990s. The experience was the experience of deliberate destruction of the civil and political rights of the union's members and beyond them their families and the communities in which they were living and working. The whole force of the state was deployed for an explicit political agenda. The experience was so shocking and the evidence much at the time, much of even greater significance since and very recently is clear. It's so clear it's believed it will assist this inquiry to revisit what was in fact and was intended to be fundamental to determining the political infrastructure of Britain in the decades that followed. The unusually clear facts go beyond focusing on one particular organisation or agency or subgroup of an organisation, for instance, the police, and consider the overarching state itself. And it helps to understand the ease with which destruction of fundamental rights occurred, the ease with which the police could be deployed in that destruction. It's important to know the NUM's lifespan. It was established in 1945 for miners in Scotland, Wales and England. In 1947, the coal industry was nationalised. The contribution of the miners to the war effort was respected. The failure of private mine ownership and the importance of the coal industry was the prime source of power integral to the strength of Britain. It was in the 1970s in particular that the Union, in part through industrial action, could make significant advances securing the most basic of entitlements for its members, reasonable pay and safer conditions. Life for a miner was always grim and dangerous, with life expectancy severely truncated. The union's total commitment was to consolidate improvement and to contribute to the trade move movement as a whole, trade union movement as a whole. The union was strong and secure. And yet in 1979, newly elected government with Mrs. Thatcher as prime minister, set in train a plan to make the union and its members the focus of exceptional and primarily secret initiatives. These included the security service, the police, all these, including the government, cultivated selective media. Some of those initiatives were too flagrant to remain secret. Others have only recently come to light. Others suspected remain to be discovered. The two aspects of the Union's experience of relevance to this inquiry. One is the extent of influence and decision-making the responsibility of the state itself, not subdivided into agencies and sub-agencies, police or security services. It is this that has come belatedly and most chillingly from the release of cabinet papers under the 30 year rule, papers in the private foundation of the former prime minister. The second issue is the evidence on what was unashamedly and openly happening and seen at the time, when it was part of an agenda on the part of the state and when the state elects to deploy every aspect of its authority, including the police, to achieve its political ends. This is what transpired at the time and this much, the second aspect, has been long known. It's recognised that the outcome of the miners' strike of 1984-85 was fundamental in determining the political and social nature of Britain in the decades that followed, and it's equally recognised the NUM found itself facing the concentrated power of the state in an unprecedented 
or nation, nationwide police deployment roadblocks, thousands of arrests and large scale use of force by the police. The way in which police forces across the UK were instrumental in attempts to defeat the miners has been for 30 years the subject of intense criticism, an unconstitutional prelude without any parliamentary authority to introduce the militarization of policing of public order, criminalizing of disobedience to police orders and the introduction of the practice of kettling protest gatherings. These constituted the public face of what happened in the miners strike and the implications were seen and understood even at the time. The evidence came from court proceedings, from journalists' investigations, from a preliminary independent police complaints investigation into what happened at all group co cooking plant in 1984, reduced in some tragic similar fault lines at Hillsborough by South Yorkshire police a few years later. The inquiry can have and see that openly available evidence of the police involvement in the criminal process to wrongly arrest, accuse, fabricate evidence against individual members of the NUM, the use of unprecedented police violence, premeditated, and collusion by the police in their actions by and with the national media, the use of informants, infiltrators, provocateurs, bugging and surveillance on an industrial scale, and the manipulation of evidence in attempts to implicate senior NUM officials in criminal acts. All of these aggressive and unlawful intrusions were countenanced by the authorities appointed to maintain the safety of the nation by lawful means. None were to do with the claim defense of democracy and with the very opposite. And in parallel, false accusations were broadcast with maximum publicity at the time. The extravagant and extraordinary language of the government was adopted by senior police talking about war, battles and battlegrounds. The virulence of the government's words went way beyond any boundaries of modern day British political life. In the summer of 1984, the Prime Minister said, we had to fight an enemy without in the Falklands. Now the war had to be taken to the enemy within, which is a much more difficult fight, and more dangerous to liberty. All of the language consistently used was of conspiracy, subversion of enemies of the state. All of these signals of unambiguous clarity being given to all government agencies and the police as to why and how the gloves should come off in the war with the NUM. There was no criminal offence of secondary picketing or the gathering of large pickets. The police intercepted vehicles, stopped pickets, dispersed what they called excessive numbers, claimed extended powers to turn back miners on pain of arrest. Pit villages were cordoned off villages occupied often by police on horseback in riot gear, imposing curfews, preventing villagers from leaving. There's no possibility that this constituted a lawful bar to freedom of movement or expression of opinion. Chief constables were lending each other officers, creating de facto standing armies. 11,300 miners were arrested in the course of the year-long strike. 7,000 miners were injured, 5,500 put on trial, 960 sacked and 200 in prison. The most exceptional manifestation of the war happened at Orgreave. 95 miners arrested, almost a third with riot, carrying up to life imprisonment the charge. But in the middle of the first trial, the trial had to be abandoned as evidence of mass fabrication of evidence it was too overwhelming for the trial to continue. More than a hundred police witnesses had been instructed to sit in schoolrooms 
and have statements dictated to them. Significant number of officers could be shown from photographic evidence never to have encountered the person they said they'd arrested whom they'd seen committing an offence. Notebooks disappeared, one at a luncheon adjournment from the witness box. But overall, a major question of why, when there were severe limitations on picketing, were thousands encouraged to attend all grieve on mass that day. Senior officer confirmed the police had assumed exceptional powers, never debated by parliament, and had deployed militarized police, mounted police, charging in to the crowd, followed by short shield police units, told to incapacitate demonstrators like a war movie. Miners suffering life that threatening injuries. Most importantly, the senior officers claim that this was a pre-elected battleground of his choosing. Sadly, this was not new. The floors of the cells in Rotherham police station that night, covered in blood and vomit, miners with severe head injuries going in and out of consciousness, needing urgent hospital treatment. It was not greatly different from the experience of Southall in 1979, where horses had charged into a peaceful crowd, objecting to the presence of National Front in a borough near to London. Dozens of head injuries, members of community groups in intensive care, and Blair Peach dead. What was different in 1984 was that the police were part of a careful plan conceived of years before. As one Welsh miner said, we were like the Belgrano there to be sunk. We were struck by some aspects of the contribution of Mr Sanders on behalf of individual officers and his emphasis on the need and also the achievement of police interventions. The concept that as yet unexplained deployments were justified on the basis of spectres of prevention of public disorder or protecting national security. It must be of importance, we suggest, in understanding how perceptions are generated and how outrageous unlawful behaviour can follow and to appreciate those connections. This is what happened during the miners' strike. The very recent part of the NUM's understanding is as important. The second critical issue beyond what the police did comes from cabinet papers released under the 30 year rule. Long suspected and not known and the reason for the strike was not to achieve greater pay or safer conditions but to protest against the suspected closure of pits, destroy the livelihood and the communities in which that livelihood was sustained. Those communities were and still are profoundly affected by the brutality and determination of the exercise of what we now see was the plan. Nevertheless, it's still shocking to read the minutes of secret meetings before the strike, confidential report to the new head of the NUM confirming an intention to close 75 pits. The beginning of the plan required wholesale secrecy. The 75 pits, meaning the loss of 70,000 jobs and, disseminate and decimating entire areas of South Wales, Scotland and the North East. The minutes, the Prime Minister says, and all of this is there to be seen, was to be kept to a minimum or not at all. Oral meetings to be the order of the day. Equally shocking in the papers to be found at Kew, the National Archives, is a letter after the strike wished for by the government had begun. There's a letter sent by Mr. McGregor and endorsed by the Prime Minister, telling the miners that it was wholly untrue 
Your leaders have told you the coal board is out to butcher the coal industry and that we plan to do away with 70,000 jobs. We plan to close 86 pits. If these, were, if these were true, I would not blame miners for getting angry and being worried. These things are absolutely untrue. I categorically and solemnly say you've been deliberately misled. It's retrospectively through these minutes that the presentation at the time of the police and their actions can be properly and truthfully assessed. There was a report from years before that planned for the destruction of the Union, talked about selecting, trying to provoke a battle in a non-vulnerable industry. A victory could win industries like the railways. The most likely area is coal. The chosen battleground could be the docks. The plan considered what it would take, knowledge catastrophic implications, that there are whole towns dependent on steelworks, coal mines, which would be severely deprived if the full efficiency policies are carried out. But nevertheless, what was envisaged is the tactic of starving the miners and their families, of withdrawing all social security benefits to ensure that they will be brought into line. The plan was to destroy the union. It was considered it's there to be seen in the NUM's statement um, lodged with the inquiry. There are extracts which are from those documents now to be seen. Considered as necessary was to be, as well as cutting off the supply of money to the strikers, um, was the concept of fragmentation of causing minor against to go against minor divisions between miners and safer mining areas with greater prospects of their pits continuing. These policies, it was considered, um, should enable us um, to succeed in the policy of fragmentation. We must be prepared to deal with the problem and dealing with the problem involved the police. The stage being set for the strike, um, it was the government who wanted the strike. They wanted the strike by the miners' union and intended to manipulate it. But what was presented throughout was the police acting under their own discretion. We could give, but there's a limitation on time. Example after example of these secret minutes of the wish to manipulate the rate of processing of arrests, the expressions of dismay at police failures to make sufficient deemed arrests, repeated references to the Prime Minister's complaint, emphasising the need for severe sentencing to be broadcast publicly, encouraging publicity for that, and dissent, disagreement with Chief Constables who express concern about the quality of evidence and wanting to delay trials, changing, changing the minutes so that the chief constables would wish for accelerated trials, discussion of moving cases out of the Yorkshire area to more friendly courts, described the Old Bailey and more friendly courts. Ministers were told the line to take was that the dispute should be seen as a matter of law and order and that it was a matter for the police, um, entirely the police discretion. Although quick to condemn claimed violence of minors and praise encouraged the police for their efforts. Even before Orgreave, concerns over police evidence 
and the way the police were behaving was being raised within the cabinet. But the frequent references to interaction between the courts, necessity of the government helping to create the climate of fear in which those arrested, including a law group and charged with riot, contemplated their future, created the impression perceived at the time by the miners that the courts and the legal process were being unduly, inappropriately intertwined with perceived political imperatives. The NUM, uh, in its initial application, drew attention for the inquiry to other initiatives which lead to suspicion of the collusion the secret and covert activities. The NUM does not know if police from the squad that is the subject matter of this inquiry were deployed in relation to its members. They have raised with the inquiry a number of their concerns, including reference by a former chief constable to a meeting of chief constables and the presence of a home office representative bringing a personal message from the prime minister convinced the official reporting that a secret communist cell was orchestrating strike complaining the fact the police could not prove this conspiracy existed was because of the weakness of our intelligence gathering was urged upon the police chiefs the necessity of a secret public intelligence unit to infiltrate and monitor groups which threatened order to go beyond special branch investigation of subversive groups intended to concentrate on legitimate groups like the NUM. All of this leads to puzzlement and concern that there is confusion as to roles as to responsibilities, as to definitions, as to lines that are drawn artificially or not artificially. For instance, the NUM noted in the run up to the miners' strike reports of MI5 giving special branch officers advanced training in an MI5 school outside Portsmouth and criticisms by MPs at the time, including Tom Dalyell, commenting on the lack of definition of responsibility between police and the security service, freedom of manoeuvre of the security service expanding during the strike because of the undefined division of responsibilities between the local police and others, and referring to the members of special bands described as MI5's foot soldiers running their own dirty tricks during the strike, reported as often singling out miners for arrest and provoking violent incidents. The NUM does not know um, any more than these fragmented indications, and it thinks it of most importance to say to the inquiry that what it can put before it in the documents that have been released concerning their industrial action and what was done to that is that perhaps artificial divisions, divisions of responsibility um, are inappropriate and that there is a greater responsibility to be addressed to the state itself. Ironically, one of the cases um, of many drawn to the attention of the inquiry, the right to strike, um, the right to protest, the right to freedom of expression, the right to personal integrity. And um, the one case that the NUM would like to draw to the inquiry's attention is a case from which we benefit of freedom of expression decided by the European Commission, the European Court of Human Rights. 
is a case of Helen Steele and Dave Morris against the UK. The case is informative on the right to freedom of expression. The irony, of course, amongst ironies, is that those two committed, dedicated protesters um, fighting in action by a global corporation over many years of their lives for the publication of the pamphlet, discover years later that it was contributed to by an undercover officer. The point that we would make be what is the role of the state? Who knew what about that factor? Who thought it appropriate or not to reveal it? Who thought it right to address the European court or not? It's the contradictions and the clashes between roles and decision making and those who are on the receiving end that are confusing in asking this inquiry how to focus. We believe that the experience of the NUM in the early 1980s goes into the 1990s, but in space of time today, all we can consider um, is perhaps the worst of the worst of the worst of years, 1984 and 1985. What the NUM asks is that the inquiry consider how the actions of the police and covert investigation or covert consideration extended not just to the 200 members at the time, or their families, or their support groups, but in a never ending ripple effect beyond into the whole of society. The year of the strike was one of intense hardship. The solidarity of the communities involved was extraordinary and it reached out to solidarity from beyond. The miners and their families had to be fed. The right of miners to protest had to be supported politically and morally as well as legally. And yet the undertone and the instructions were explicit. If the miners were the enemy, all had volunteered on the enemy side in the war. We draw this, these references and the deep suspicions to the inquiry and to allow the disclosure that might enable not just the contacting of hundreds of individuals whose memories could be searched, that's fundamental, but those who reached out to groups and welcomed them into soup kitchens volunteers collecting coal not dole and their privacy. Most of all, the right to freedom of expression. The NUM believes that every indication of what it can put forward to this inquiry shows that what happened to the union was beyond the bounds of any justification for lawfulness. It was a plan for pub national security and public order to be an excuse for the plan that was wished for. And that plan was itself wholly, totally, outrageously unlawful. Thank you, Chair.